much. It's an honor to be here in our community. We know Granite Staters are engaged, and we know there are issues that strike especially close to home here. New Hampshire has one of the highest rates of deadly overdoses in the country. In some cases, police and paramedics tell us that they are saving the same lives again and again, sometimes more than once in a single day. It's a health care issue, but it's also so much more. Mayor Buttigieg, you have described yourself as a moderate, but one of your policies at least goes further than some on the stage with you are willing to go. You have called for the decriminalization of all drugs. Does that include heroin, meth, and cocaine, some of the drugs that have contributed to this crisis? No, what I've called for is that incarceration should no longer be the response to drug possession. With all due respect, Mayor Buttigieg, on your website, it yeah. says that you call for decriminalization yeah. of all drugs. Again, what I'm calling for is that we end the use of incarceration as a response. This does not mean that it will be lawful to produce or distribute those kinds of harmful drugs. But also, as we know from the opioid crisis, some of this has been driven by companies that were acting irresponsibly with substances that were lawful. It's why in South Bend we sued those companies to hold them accountable. We've got to make sure that there is accountability for those who suppress evidence about the addictiveness of those substances, even while we're also coming to recognize that these kinds of addiction are a medical issue, not a moral failure on the part of somebody battling that addiction. That's why medication-assisted treatment is so important. And those people who are being revived, and, and our own EMTs in my city have been so frustrated by the experience of reviving somebody, but then they have nowhere to go. Sometimes you get brought back with a dose of Narcan, but then your life depends on whether in the days that follow you make it until somebody can actually see you because we have such a shortage of mental health and addiction providers in this country. We must act to change that and save lives when we do. I want to bring this question now to Mr. Yang. You've said you would decriminalize opioids, but you've also said that you would require all overdose patients to go to mandatory treatment centers for three days. Well, right now in New Hampshire, there aren't enough beds in treatment centers and across the country. How would you make sure treatment is available for all overdose patients? And what would you do to fill the gap in the meantime? That's what we have to change, Monica. I've heard heartbreaking stories from families here in New Hampshire that have been destroyed, torn apart by the opiate epidemic. And you have to look at the companies that profited to the tune of tens of billions of dollars in profits of essentially blood money. As president, we will take back those profits and put them to work right here in New Hampshire so that if you are seeking treatment, you have resources to be able to pursue it. We, this is not a money problem fundamentally, this is a human problem, but money cannot be the obstacle. This is something that happened on the government's watch. The government allowed this opiate epidemic to spread throughout our communities, and we have to do everything in our power to actually make sure that if you are seeking treatment, you know you're not going to be sent to jail. We have safe injection and safe consumption sites for you. If you have a family member who's struggling, you can refer them and know that they're not going to have criminal penalties as a result. There is so much about this that's endemic to what's happened throughout the country in terms of companies running amok, this hyper-corporate capitalism where if money's on one side in this country and people are on the other side, the money is winning. You can see it with the opiate epidemic, you can see it with the military industrial complex, the fossil fuel companies. This is what we must change, and that's where I'll lead as president. Senator Klobuchar, I want to take the question to you now. As a prosecutor, you embrace tough on crime policies, even with drug offenders. You've also spoken many times about your father's own addiction issues, his own alcoholism, and his DUI arrests. If addiction is a disease, should people be arrested for it? And as a prosecutor, do you regret sending people with substance abuse issues to jail? Um, I led one of the most successful drug courts in the country in Hennepin County, and I always would say and believed, and I think my record shows this, um, that we weren't a business. We didn't want to see repeat customers. And if you don't want to see repeat customers, the only answer is treatment. And maybe you're referring to some of the people who were dealing big time in drugs. Uh, yes, I felt that we should prosecute those people. Uh, but when it comes to, and you asked uh, Mr. Yang, 
saying a question, and I think it, we owe it to the people of New Hampshire to have had one of the biggest addiction rates in the country and death rates when it comes to opioids to explain how we will pay for the treatment and the beds. I've been very clear about this. There's going to be a major settlement coming through, a federal settlement against all these opioid manufacturers. The evidence is is overwhelming, including an email where one guy, a business guy, says to the other, they're eating them like Doritos. Just keep pumping them out. We will get a conservative estimate, $40 billion in from that settlement. We can put a two cents per milligram tax on opiates that brings in another $40 billion. Then you can close the hedge fund loophole that brings in $18 billion. And just like every other policy I've proposed, and I think New Hampshire voters should care about this, I have showed how I'm going to pay for it. Uh, because I think we have someone in the White House that has told over 15,000 lies. He makes all kinds of promises. The people of New Hampshire and the people of our country deserve better. I will get this done, and it is personal for me. Good evening, candidates. New Hampshire is a battleground not just for presidential contenders, but also for top issues, and that includes gun policy. Senator Sanders, for many voters in this Democratic primary, your allure is about consistency. When it comes to progressive issues, you've been on the right side of them for a long time. One exception is gun rights. In the 90s, when you were in Congress, you voted against background checks. And you also voted against a waiting period for purchase of a firearm. Can you explain why you oppose these things that you now support? I, I can, Adam. And, and let me also say that in 1988, I probably lost a race for Congress, and we only have one congressperson in the whole state. Because in 1988, I said that we should ban the sale and distribution of assault weapons in this country. That was 30 years ago. Furthermore, furthermore, I am very proud that today I have a D minus voting record for from the NRA. And under my administration, it will be the American people doing gun policy, not dictated by the NRA. But to answer your question, I come, like New Hampshire, from a very, very rural state. In Vermont, un until last two years ago, we had virtually no gun control legislation at all, and I represented that perspective. The world has changed. In Vermont and in New Hampshire and all over this country, people are sickened by the mass shootings that we have seen and the gun violence that we have seen. The world has changed and my views have changed. And my view is right now, <clears throat> We need universal background checks. We end the gun show loophole. We end the so-called straw man provision. We make certain that we end the sale and distribution of assault weapons in this country. And we go further. We go further. But at the bottom line is I will not be intimidated by the NRA. We're going to run the gun policy that the American people want. Vice President Biden, you've taken a lot of heat in this primary on these debate stages and from voters here in New Hampshire for your past positions. You've essentially asked them to look at the totality of your record and give you the benefit of the doubt. Does Senator Sanders deserve that same benefit of the doubt on guns? Well, look, here's the deal. The biggest mistake that Bernie made, that Senator Sanders made, he voted to give the gun manufacturer the only major industry in America, and a, a, a loophole that does not allow them to be sued for the carnage they are creating. First thing I'll do as president is work to get rid of that. It's going to be hard. Think of all the thousands and thousands of people who died. And I might add, Bernie, while you were representing your constituency, an awful lot of people in the gun state and they've come around. In fact, all those folks in California, New York, Pennsylvania, they were getting killed by the thousands during this same period. I come from a state that's a major gun owning state. I introduced the first assault weapons ban. I, in fact, got it passed. I'm the only guy that beat the NRA twice. Twice. I was while I was pushing the Brady background bill check uh, background checks Bernie voted five times against it when he was in the house so look the other thing is that when we, we have to be held accountable for the things we did I'm the guy that set up drug courts I set them up I wrote it into law and it never got funded and also on opioids I'm the guy who's already begun to make a down payment in the cures act I put in one billion dollars to fight opioid addiction and and lastly, my time is going to be up shortly. Here's the deal. Those chief executive officers, those drug companies, they should not only be fined, they should go to jail.
Senator Warren, we'd like to go to you now. Yeah. Plans count for a lot. I want to ask you this question here, though. Laws can do so much. If you could change one thing about America's gun culture, what would it be? Look, we have a gun violence problem in America. It is about the mass shootings that we hear about in our schools and that frighten us, about in theaters and in churches. It's also, though, about shootings that occur on sidewalks and in playgrounds, often in communities of color that are hit hardest. But there are no headlines over those. It's also about suicide and the increased lethality of suicide because of the availability of guns. It is also about the increased chances that it's usually a woman will die of domestic violence if she is with a violent man and a gun is in the home. We need to think of this problem not as one and done or three things and done. We need to think of it just like we did on auto safety. We just keep coming back. We treat it like the public health emergency that it is. But the question we should be asking ourselves is when America across this country, including gun owners, agree in certain basic things, universal background checks, get assault weapons off the streets, why can we not even get a vote in the United States Senate? And the answer is 90%. Think about this. More than 90% of Americans agree on this. We can't get a vote in the United States Senate because it is the gun industry that continues to call the shots. Until we attack the corruption in Washington, the influence of money on campaigns and lobbying, we're not going to be able to meet our promises. And one more, until we agree that we are willing to roll back the filibuster, the gun industry is going to continue to have a veto and we will never make the changes we make. We have to be willing to build a future that works not for a gun industry, but that works for the rest of America and protects our children. You've got to be able to see the gun industry. Thank you, candidates. We're going to go back to David up there. At the Adam, Adam, Monica, thank you and thanks to WMUR tonight. I want to turn to the Supreme Court, the balance on the court and the issues before the court right now. President Trump in just the last 24 hours we're saying we've appointed 191 federal judges, two Supreme Court justices, keeping his campaign promise to shift the court to the right with Neil Gorsuch and Brett Kavanaugh. The Affordable Care Act is at the court, climate change is working its way to the court, and a major abortion case is on the docket this year. Vice President Biden, on the issue of abortion, in 2012, you said President Obama's two Supreme Court picks of them, there was no litmus test. We picked people who had an open mind, did not come with an agenda. And you've said before, we both believe that we should not apply narrow litmus tests to appointees to the Supreme Court. But I also do, wait, say, let me just let me just ask: Would you do it differently as president, Mr. Vice President? Would there be a litmus test on if abortion? If you say the rest of what I said, I said that we're going to not appoint anyone who did not have a view that unenumerated rights existed in the Constitution. That's not a specific test; it's a generic test. And only way, the only reason women have the right to choose is because it's determined that there's unenumerated rights coming from the Ninth Amendment in the Constitution. That's what I said, and I was I. Was was part of the reason why Elena Kagan, who worked for me, got on the Supreme Court. I was part of the reason why Ruth Bader Ginsburg is on the court. I was part of the reason why Sotomayor is on the court, and she swore me in. I presided, and I'm the reason why this right wasn't taken away a long time ago, because I almost single-handedly made sure that Robert Bork did not get on the court, because he did not think there should be enumerated rights. Unenumerated. So let me just Let's drill down. that straight. Mr. Vice President, I am aware of what you said, which is why I'm asking, would you do it differently now? Would there be a litmus test on abortion? Yes, look, here's the deal. The litmus test on abortion relates to a, a fundamental value in the Constitution. A woman does have a right to choose. I would, in fact, if they rule it to be unconstitutional, I will send to the United States Congress, and it will pass, I believe, a bill that, off, that, that, that excuse me, legislates Roe v. Wade adjusted by Casey. It should, it's a woman's right to do that, period. And if you call that a litmus test, it's a litmus test. But what I was talking about in the past, so no one gets confused, here is if there is no if you, if you read the Constitution very very narrowly and say there are no unenumerated rights if it doesn't say it in the Constitution it doesn't exist you cannot have any of the things I care about any of the things I care about as a progressive member of the United States Congress at the time and as vice president and as a member of society mr. vice president thank you senator Warren look I've lived in an America in which abortion was illegal and rich women still got abortions. 
And that's what we have to remember about this. States are heading toward trying to ban abortion outright, and the Supreme Court seems headed in exactly that direction as well. If we are going to protect the people of the United States of America, and we are going to protect our rights to have dominion over our own bodies, then it's going to mean we can't simply rely on the courts. Three out of every four people in America believe right now that the rule of Roe versus Wade should be the law. That means we should be pushing for a congressional solution as well. It is time to have a national law to protect the right of a woman's choice. Senator Warren, thank you. <laughs> Senator Klobuchar, I do want to come to you. Should there be a litmus test? Could you? It's an active hall here tonight. I did want to come to you on this question as Thank well. You. Should there be a litmus test on abortion? Um, I would only appoint judges that would respect precedent, and one of those key precedents is Roe v. Wade. In addition, in addition, you have got to put it into law. Donald Trump, and I think it's really important to take it to him, to him here, when he was running for election, and this is a case I will make on the debate stage against him, he actually said that he wanted to put women in jail. He then dialed it back and said, no, I want to put doctors in jail. Is it a big surprise then we're seeing states like Alabama start enacting laws that would criminalize doctors who perform abortions? It's not. And that is why it's going to be really important when you look at the overwhelming public support for funding Planned Parenthood, for making sure women have access to contraceptions, to making sure that they have a right to choose, that we make this case strongly and loudly. Senator Klobuchar, thank you. Mayor Buttigieg, you have signaled that you'd be open to the idea of expanding the court. Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg had suggested leaving the court as it is, saying, quote, nine seems to be a good number. And in fact, she said if the number of justices is increased, quote, it would make the court appear partisan. It would be one side saying when we're in power, we're going to enlarge the number of judges to have more people who will vote the way we want them to. Is Justice Ginsburg wrong? Well, if all we did was change the number of justices, then I agree with her that that could be the consequence. What I've called for is not only reforming the number of justices on the bench, but structural reform so that some of the justices are not appointed through a partisan process. We cannot allow the Supreme Court to continue to become one more political battlefield as we are seeing today. And the time has come for us to think bigger, not just reforming the makeup of the court, as America, by the way, has done several times in our history, but also remember that the founders gave us the power power to amend the Constitution for a reason, and we shouldn't be afraid to use it. It's not something you do lightly or quickly, but when it comes to something like Citizens United, which holds that corporations have the same political soul as people, and that spending money to influence an election is the same thing as writing an op-ed to your local paper, we need a constitutional amendment to clear that up and protect our democracy. Mayor Buttigieg, thank you. Vice President Biden, I do want to come to you on this. President Trump has said that the only reason Democrats want to expand the court is they want to try and catch up. You have called any expansion of the court a bad idea, adding, we will live to rue that day. Do you agree with President Trump on that? I agree with Ruth Bader Ginsburg. That's who I agree with. And I agree the way to deal with Citizens United is pass a constitutional amendment I introduced 25 years ago, saying that only public money can be spent in elections, period. Not private money, not billionaires, not money from special interests, period. That's the way to amend the Constitution and deal with that. In addition to that, if in fact, look, the Democrats stood up against the man I revere, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He wanted to expand the court. But they were wise enough to understand that whoever then is a the majority will have the ability to abuse it, and it will lose its legitimacy. And there are three equal branches of government. The, it says the president shall nominate, the Senate shall dispose, the Senate shall make that decision, not the president. He can nominate. This. That's why it's so important. We must win back the United States Senate this time out. And that's why, as... as as, as you all look at it up here in New Hampshire and around the world, or, excuse me, around the country, you have to ask yourself, who is most likely to help get a senator elected in North Carolina, Georgia? Who can win Florida, Pennsylvania, Minnesota? Who can do that? Because you've got to be able to win those. Well, you can. I, I agree. But here's the point. 
You've got to be able to. You've got to be able to not just win. You've got to bring along a United States Senate or this becomes moot. Okay. Senator Sanders. Thank you. Uh, look, you asked the simple question. Is there a litmus test for those of us up here? For me, there is. I will never nominate any person to the Supreme Court or the federal courts in general who is not 100% pro Roe v. Wade. Number two, we, we have got to codify Roe v. Wade into legislation. Number three, we have to significantly expand funding for Planned Parenthood. Mr. Steyer, I want to bring you in on this because you have claimed that when it comes to the Supreme Court, you have said Republicans have been cheating. Sure they've been cheating. Look, what we saw Mitch McConnell do, not just in the Supreme Court with Merrick Garland, but across the board with federal judges, was refuse to allow President Obama's picks to be considered. That's why Mr. Trump has appointed so many federal judges, because in fact, the Republicans refused to allow President Obama to get his due. And honestly, we're sitting here talking about, do you have a litmus test? We all have the litmus test. Everybody on this row feels exactly the same way about a woman's right to choose. Everybody on this row feels exactly the same way on, on gun control. Every single one in this row feels the same way. There's something else going on. These Republicans are in control. They're stacking the court for a generation with young right-wing radicals, and we've watched it happen, and the question is, what are we going to do about it? There is That's where we are in the United States. And the question is, actually, Joe Biden's right. We have to go win a huge victory this year, there and we're in trouble. And so the question is going to be, look at these people. Who can pull together the Democratic Party? And let me say this. We have not said one word tonight about race. Not one word. Are you kidding me? We have the most diverse party. We have a very diverse country. We have a very diverse party. The heart and soul of this party is diversity, black people, Latinos, AAPI people, Native Americans, and white people. But for goodness sakes, pull it together. This, we're talking about something different. The question we have is, how are we getting that diverse group of people to the polls? What are we saying? Everybody on this stage feels the same way about a woman's right to choose and economic justice. The question is, how do we beat Trump? How do we take down these Republicans? And the answer is, we've got to show we can take them down on growth, job creation, the economy. We send them packing, and then we get all of this, including beating the corporation. Mr. Steyer, thank you. The night is still young. Many questions to come, and, and Lindsey Davis is next. I want to turn now to criminal justice. Mayor Buttigieg, under your leadership as mayor, a black resident in South Bend, Indiana, was four times more likely to be arrested for marijuana possession than a white resident. Now, that racial disparity is higher than the rest of the state. In fact, it's higher than the rest of the nation. And that disparity increased in South Bend after you took office. When talking about the problem on national terms, you've called it, quote, evidence of systemic racism. But you were mayor for eight years, so weren't you, in effect, the head of the system? And how do you explain that increase in black arrests under your leadership? Well, the reality is, on my watch, drug arrests in South Bend were lower than the national average, and specifically to marijuana, lower than in Indiana. But there is no question that systemic racism has penetrated to every level of our system, and my city was not immune. I took a lot of heat for discussing systemic racism with my own police department. But we've got to confront the fact that there is no escaping how this is part of all of our policies. Earlier, we were talking about opioids. And thankfully, America has come to a better understanding about the fact that opioid addiction is best understood as a medical problem. But there were a lot of people, including a lot of African-American activists in my community, who have made the very good point. It's great that everybody's so enlightened about drug policy now when it comes to opioids, but where were you when it came to marijuana? Where were you when it came to the crack epidemic in the 1990s? That is one of the reasons why I am calling for us as a country to take up those reforms that end incarceration as a response to possession and make sure that we legalize marijuana and when we do it, do it retroactively proactively with expungements to correct the harm done in so many cases of incarceration, disproportionately of black and brown Americans, where the incarceration did far more harm. Right. Want to go back to the original question, deal. though. How do you explain the increase in black arrests in South Bend under your leadership for marijuana possession? And again, 
the overall rate was lower. No, there was the an increase. Rate. The year before you were in office, it was lower. Once you became in office in 2012, that number went up. In 2018, the last number of year that we have a record for, that number was still up. Yep. And one of the strategies that our community adopted was to target when there were cases where there was gun violence and gang violence, which was uh, slaughtering so many in our community burying teenagers, disproportionately black teenagers. We adopted a strategy that said that drug enforcement would be targeted in cases where there was a connection to the most violent group or gang connected to a murder. These things are all connected, but that's the point. So are all of the things that need to change in order for us to prevent violence and remove the effects of systemic racism, not just from criminal justice, but from our economy, from health, from housing, and from our democracy itself. Senator Warren, is that a substantial answer from Mayor Buttigieg? No. to own up to the facts. And it's important to own up to the facts about how race has totally permeated our criminal justice system. You know, for the exact same crime, study after study now shows that African Americans are more likely than whites to be detained, to be arrested, to be taken to trial, to be wrongfully convicted, and to receive harsher sentences. We need to rework our criminal justice system from the very front end on what we make illegal all the way through the system and how we help people come back into the community. But we cannot just say that criminal justice is the only time we want to talk about race specifically. We need to start having race conscious laws. Housing, for example. I have a great housing plan to build more housing in America, but understand it was the policy of the United States of America to discriminate against African Americans and people, uh, any other people of color for buying homes until 1965. You can't just repeal that and say, okay, now everything is even. It's not. We need race conscious laws in education, in employment, in entrepreneurship to make this country a country of opportunity for everyone, no matter the color of their skin. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, with, with respect. Uh, with, with respect, you can't regulate away racism with a whole patchwork of laws that are race specific. What we have to do is heed the writings of Martin Luther King, whose birthday we just celebrated. He said that capitalism forgets that life is social, and what he was championing was a guaranteed minimum income for all Americans of $1,000 a month or more that would end up reshaping our economy in communities of color, make it so that black net worth is not 10% of white net worth in this country, which is the most important number of them all. We can't regulate that away through any other means except by putting money directly into the hands of African Americans and Latinos and people of color to allow businesses to actually flourish and grow in those communities. The only way that will happen is if black and Latino consumers have buying power, and that is where we have to move as a country. Senator no, Sanders, then Mr. Steyer. Andrew, no, let me say this. I disagree with you, Andrew. I am the person on this stage who will say openly, I'm for reparations. Something wrong happened. I am for reparations to African Americans in this country, and anyone who thinks that racism is a thing of the past and not an ongoing problem is not dealing with reality. In fact, three days ago, one of the leaders of Joe Biden's South Carolina uh, campaign made racist remarks about someone associated with our campaign. And the Legislative Black Caucus went out en masse to stand up for that man and for our campaign. Joe, I'm asking you to come with me and the Legislative Black Caucus and disavow Dick Harputlian and what he had to say it was wrong. And I'm asking you to join us, be on the right side. I'm asking you to join me and join in the support I have from the overwhelming number of the members of that Black Caucus. I have more support in South Carolina in the Black Caucus and the black community than anybody else. Double what you have or anybody else But wait a second, wait a second. Quite Bernie. Well, that is quite right. Let's no. not argue about polls. This isn't about polls. This is not about polls. I'm not talking about polls. I'm not talking about polls. I'm not talking about polls. We have nine members of the Black Caucus in South Carolina supporting us. But more importantly, much of what Elizabeth said is absolutely correct. We have a racist society from top to bottom impacting health care, housing, criminal justice, education, you name it. 
and clearly this is an issue that must be dealt with. But in terms of criminal justice, what we have got to do is understand the system is broken, is racist. We invest in our young people in jobs and education, not more jails and incarceration. We end the war on drugs, which has disproportionately impacted African Americans, Latinos, and Native Americans. We end private prisons and detention centers in America. Bernie, I appreciate and what we, you're saying. And, excuse me, we also, most people don't know this, tonight in America, 200,000 people are in jail without having been convicted of anything. That's right. 200,000 people because they can't afford the 500 bucks for bail they need to get out of jail. That is outrageous. We've got to end cash bail. Okay, let me say this. I've worked, Bernie. I've worked to end cash bail in California and it's gone. I've worked to end private prisons in California and they're gone. I'm somebody who's, our family, my wife and I started a bank specifically to support businesses owned by women, black people and Latinos because they couldn't get financing anywhere else. But I, Joe, I want to answer, really, I think you should come over and disavow the statements that this man made because, uh, that were uh, openly racist that we're wrong and the legislative black caucus is against, I'm asking you to join us and do the right thing. I've already spoken to Dick Carpoolian and uh, he in fact is, uh, was, uh, is, I believe, uh, sorry for what he said. But here's the deal, folks. Look, we got to stop taking the black community for granted. That's the starting place. Every one of the things we talked about here, for example, in South Carolina, Jim Clyburn, he has a program, 10, 15, 30. We should be investing our money in those communities that haven't gotten help for a long time and give most of that help to those communities. Make it a priority. We should make sure that we have in the, no one going to jail for a, a, a drug offense. They go directly mandatory prison. I mean, excuse me, mandatory treatment, not prison. And we fund it. And we fund it and three days doesn't get it. It takes at least 60 to 90 days to make any progress. We have to pay for that. Just like instead of building new prisons, we build new rehabilitation centers. We have to make sure that we have a window at the Treasury Department that allows entrepreneurs who are black and brown and minorities to be able to get loans to be able to start businesses. You know, if you own a house, you, I know you do know, if you own a house in an all-black neighborhood, same exact house in an all-white neighborhood, exact same shape, the house value in the black neighborhood would be valued as worth less, making it difficult for you to accumulate wealth, as, as my friend at the end of the line here says. So here's the deal. We have to do much, much more. That's what got me involved in politics in the first place, redlining to stop it. I got involved through the civil rights movement. I became a public defender. That's why I got involved. There's so many things we have to do across the board, and in education, at-risk schools. We should triple the funding we have for at-risk schools to provide for four, five, and six years old to be able to go, three, four, and five years old to go to school, not daycare. Increase the salaries of teachers. Encourage more blacks to get into teaching, especially black men, because the studies show when there's a black man in a community, in a school, it increases prospects significantly, and so on. There's a lot we can do. I've laid it all out as how to do it. Go to JoeBiden.com. You'll see the whole deal, including criminal justice reform. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. As you mentioned, South Carolina, three weeks from tomorrow, they'll go to the polls to vote. Black voters make up about 60 percent of the electorate there. Senator Sanders, several weeks ago, Nina Turner, one of your national co-chairs published an op-ed piece that said Vice President Biden has, quote, repeatedly betrayed black voters to side with Republican lawmakers and undermine our progress. Senator Sanders, do you agree with her? One of your most visible surrogates that Vice President Biden has repeatedly betrayed black voters? Well, I think what Senator Turner was talking about is some of the early actions uh, of Vice President Biden. But no, uh, Joe Biden is a friend of mine. Uh, and I'm not here to attack them. Uh, but what I would say is that what we need in terms of the African American community is to understand that we have got to start investing big time in education, in healthcare. There is no excuse why white families in America have 10 times more wealth than black families. No excuse that disproportionately African Americans are in jail compared to whites. No excuse for black women dying in childbirth three times the rate that white women are doing as well. 